Okay, so we are uh, welcoming Andrew Peel, who is going to present us, talk about uh, Home Builder. And uh, thank you for uh, doing this presentation, and uh, you can proceed. All right, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I believe I know how to do it. Okay, cool. All right, so you guys can see my screen then? Good there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah, so the presentation that I'm going to be giving today is going to be on Home Builder. And this is an open source 3D design estimating and manufacturing platform that's built on Blender. Uh, the main focus that I've been working on is design functionality with a heavy emphasis on ease of use. And my goal is to make this design platform accessible and usable by anyone. Uh, Blender isn't really typically known to be easy to use, um, so I've been putting a lot of focus on creating functionality like drag and drop, right-click properties, um, and just automating a lot of the tedious and complicated tasks when it comes to design. I'll be doing a demonstration of the functionality here in just a bit, but before I get into that, um, I want to do a quick background on myself and just explain how the project got started. So I've been a software developer for about 10 years now. Uh, the majority of my development cre career has been working for a software company called Microvellum. They develop software for the woodworking industry. And the majority of their clients are uh, medium to large cabinet manufacturers. Um, and they develop an AutoCAD-based design, engineering, and manufacturing platform. And while working at Microvellum, I pretty much had every um, uh, task. I worked in every department. While working there from tech support, uh, training, marketing, sales, and of course, development. But the most interesting project that I worked on while I was working uh, for Microvelm was an open source design platform called Fluid Designer. This was developed for about five years with them, uh, but in the end, the decision was made to focus all of their development on their AutoCAD based product. And so the product was never really able to meet its full potential, but I learned a lot during the development. And if we jump, now to the beginning of this year, we have a global pandemic. Microvelm needed to reduce uh, payroll. So a portion of the employees were temporarily laid off with me being one of them, which um, ended up being really one of the best things that could have happened because now um, I've got a lot of time on my hands to really focus what I'm passionate about, which is developing open source software. And while working with Blender, um, I found that it's a really powerful application and is being developed at such a rapid rate that um, if it's not already, it's becoming one of the best 3D platforms and not just for animated films, but also for architectural design. So in March of the beginning of this year, I am in lockdown and I've got nothing but time to focus on development for Blender. And so I took everything that I learned while working um, on the Fluid Designer project, and I started from scratch. And there was a couple of years um, where Fluid uh, the Fluid Designer development had stopped, and Blender was making a lot of really big improvements from the upgrade to 2.8 and now to the 2.9 series. And so there was a lot of the core functionality that was um, different, and I wanted to kind of structure things a little bit different as I started on this project. So. The first thing that I did was I developed the PyClone system, which is an asset management engine um, that's responsible for registering the libraries with Blender. And it also defines the structure of parametric assets, um, which I call assemblies. And so after I developed kind of the core structure, I then um, started to work on just different libraries just to kind of uh, get a use case and see what the system was uh, capable of. So I started out with Toybox, which is the um, which is a library that deals with Blender's, or Blender's uh, standard data types. So objects, materials, collections, worlds, um, just all of the standard uh, standard assets. Then I uh, started to develop a library called Particle Painter, which deals with particle systems in Blender. So grass and hair, just being able to paint those onto objects. Then I started to work on another library that dealt with um, files that aren't native to Blender. So OBJ, images, 3DS, FBX, DXF, just different types of formats that you want to be able to bring into Blender. Uh, and so you can just drag those assets 
into the 3D viewport, it does the conversion process and allows you to place them within the scene. Then I worked on a library that focused kind of is more of functionality to where it allowed you to save um, camera presets and then also views within your design. So you can kind of quickly save a view and then get back to that view within the design. And then after I um, worked on those libraries, I then started on Home Builder, which is the library that I'll be talking about today, which is all about architectural and really focusing on interior design. And so I'm going to go ahead and do a demonstration in just a little bit. But before I uh, leave the PowerPoint, I've only got a couple more slides. And I want to talk about kind of the, the next, um, I guess, the timeline for the project or kind of what I plan on developing. And so right now, the main focus is data and design functionality. There are a lot of different types of libraries that need to be created. I've got a lot of the um, pretty much the bare bones of what is needed but there's so many different manufacturers of appliances that need to be included. Um, there's a lot more types of cabinetry, um, lighting fixtures, door styles. Um, and then also with the design functionality, I want to um, improve a lot of that to make it easier for users to lay out their scene quickly. Um, did my camera just shut off? Uh, I think when you, when you are uh, sharing your screen, we cannot see your camera. Maybe I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, but we can. Um, see your screen, so okay, sounds good. Um, and so I just continue on here. Um, so the um, let's see, where was I? Yeah. So the data and design functionality is pretty much what I'm working on right now. Um, next, being able to generate 2D and 3D drawings is also a big um, part of this. And so Blender obviously has a lot of focus on 3D uh, design and being able to generate those types of renderings, but 2D is just important. So dimensions, page layouts, title blocks, elevations, sections, things like that. And um, with both of these, the design functionality and generating 2D drawings, um, I do plan on working closely with the um, two other add-ons that this community really focuses on, which is Archipack and um, Blender BIM or Open BIM, I believe. And so, um, so I really want to integrate those packages within the functionality as well. Um, then after that, we um, are going to be getting into reporting, which is just generating cut lists, hardware takeoff, uh, estimating reports, and then also manufacturing. And so, just being able to generate the um, nested base optimizations and have CNC machinery cut out those parts and be able to automate that whole process from when you lay out the um, design, you have a very easy way of just sending that information to manufacturing. And so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and do a um, quick demonstration. I'm going to be doing demonstration that focuses on the design functionality of Home Builder and then doing a demonstration that kind of focuses more on the um, assemblies, kind of the, the parametric information and how I structure all of the library data. And so um, we'll be getting into that now. So let's go ahead and just jump into the application. Okay. All right, so right now I have a custom build of Blender that is called PyClone. And this is because Blender does not currently implement the ability to drag and drop assets into the scene. And so that is going to be um, eventually implemented by Blender. They are working on their own asset management system. And so eventually PyClone won't be a custom build. It'll just be an add-on for Blender that can be used, um, but until, that functionality is implemented. I've got this custom build um, that I'm working with. And so here on the left-hand side, we have the library. And then here are the different types of libraries that are implemented within the system. And the top one being Home Builder. Here, this dropdown allows us to access all of the different categories. And so when it comes to uh, drawing walls, you can basically just drag these into the scene and then continue to draw out your scene and pick points. Then you can either right click or escape to cancel the command um, and 
create your room layout that way. After that, you have the ability to select the walls independently. And if you right click, every asset within Home Builder has the ability to access the prompts page, which is just all of the common options that you would expect to have. And so here we can adjust the length of these walls or you know, type in an exact dimension. Um, we, and let's make this a bit bigger here. Apart from that, you also have the ability to quickly add just in a floor and a room light just to kind of have an automated way of generating the uh, lighting, things like that. Now for the uh, floor and the light, there's also options to be able to adjust the scale of the texture that's assigned to the floor and for lighting, the ability to just change the energy and just other options that may need to be adjusted for the lighting. Um, so yeah, generating the room layout, fairly simple. Um, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, next, if we get into doors and windows, we have the ability to just drag these assets. They automatically snap to the walls, things like that. And when you left click, you can place these assets and continue to place them or escape or right click to cancel the command. Now, one thing that's um, nice about these assets is that they're made out of what are called assemblies. And so if we right click, we have all of the common options that you would expect of being able to change the size of the door, open the door, change it to a left or right swing or have it swing you know, into the room. So there's different options here that can be adjusted, but we have the components that can be swapped out. And these are customizable by the user. And so you can create your own and save these assets to the library. And so this door is made up of a couple of different components. So we obviously have the door panel, which if we select this, we can swap out by just selecting a different style within this viewport. And then we have the frame as well. And so here there are several different types of frames that can be selected and that will just swap out the, the frame. So you kind of have these two different components that can be used and then of course the handle as well. There's only a few different options, but again, the idea is that users will be able to create their own assets, save them to the library, and the home builder um, library is kind of the thing that connects all of these assets together and makes it easy for users to just model out one component and then use that within their library. Um, next, for creating um, windows are pretty similar concept to where you can just drag and drop those into the scene here. If we um, access the prompts, the window has just a frame and a insert. And so obviously the frame being the casing or whatever information um, you have on the outside. And then the interior is just going to be what style door. And again, I've really focused on just kind of generating the kind of the basics of what's needed and then we'll be able to extend the library and have a lot more different types of um, options available within here that users can either just download additional assets or again, save their own. Um, when it comes to laying out cabinetry within the environment, got a library of different types of cabinets. And again, these are just dragged into the scene and easily placed within the, or within the uh, room. We have appliances as well to where these dragged into the scene. And if you put your cursor on top of another asset, there is some logic built in that will automatically position these in a way to where it kind of makes sense. Also, if you access the prompts of one of these cabinets later on, you can always adjust the location, which you know any cabinets that are snapped together would automatically um, be connected, or you can adjust the width as well. And so that makes it quite, um, easy for users to modify this information. And then within that, the, obviously cabinets have a variety of different options. We'll get into these in a little bit, but let me just quickly um, lay out a few other products here within this environment. I'm gonna snap these together, maybe put a refrigerator next to this and let's go ahead and put one more tall cabinet. Okay, and so with these um, added to the scene, um, when you're dealing with appliances, I've added functionality that kind of simplifies the process. So since we have 
a range here. It's pretty common to have a range hood above that. And so being able to just um, one, select a manufacturer. Uh, and of course, right now I only have Thermador. It's pretty um, time consuming to model or find these types of assets um, within the, um, but a lot of manufacturers do have 3D models that you can access. And so I just found some common ones that, um, you know, are good examples and kind of show how the functionality can work. But of course, just being able to create one simple asset and then have it um, shown in this interface and kind of custom or and then streamline the process of adding these to the environment just makes it real easy for users. Um, yeah, let's see, I'm just going to make a bit more room here, move this whole thing over. Now, if you wanted to, um, there's also commands that are available for the different types of assets. So for cabinets, you can move, grab, or duplicate. Um, move is kind of like the standard placement to where it snaps to you know, the walls and kind of has a way of positioning itself in a logical way. Grab works a lot like the standard blender um, G command to where you can just kind of move it wherever you want to. Um, and then duplicate will also just you know, duplicate the cabinet and then give you the ability to just place that. So you can make whatever modifications you want and then just copy those cabinets um, around. Apart from that, you can also use arrow keys just to kind of rotate this before you position it. So it just kind of gives you a quick way of laying this information out. Um, let's just put a couple more products here. And so, for uh, cabinetry, it's also common that you'll want to position sinks and faucets within the environment. And that process within Blender is pretty time consuming right now. And so um, by adding that information to the right click properties to where if you want to sink, you can just turn that option on, select the style of sink that you want and have it automatically cut the hole in the countertop and just make it, you know, easy to to design or just, you know, determine what um, asset you want to use there. And of course, uh, faucets work in the same way to where you'll have a library of different assets that can be viewed within the interface. And then you can just select um, whoops, which one you want. And in some cases, it'll position itself. Let me use a different, let's try that. That looks a little bit better. And so, you know, being able to position and just determine what asset you want to use is pretty, pretty simple to do. Um, I guess, as far as the design functionality, is there any questions or anything? Um, I don't have, let me see if there are. Okay, yeah, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, Fluid Designer based on Blender. Yeah, Fluid Designer was also a Blender based uh, design application as well. Um, yeah, can I, can I make a question? Um, this uh, pie clone, does it mean that uh, I have, let's say, if I want to use a uh, home builder, I have to download, uh, let's say, this, uh, let's say, version that you have constructed? Yes, yeah, so you, it does include, or you have to use this version in order to use the drag and drop functionality. Um, I have some ideas of kind of changing the way that things are placed within the scene, just for people that do want to use a standard version of Blender, they can um, easily just, um, I guess, just have the functionality changed a little bit to where they won't drag and drop. They would, you know, maybe click a hotkey in order to place the products within the scene. Um, but of course, when Blender does release the official asset management engine, they have talking, I've, I've spoken with the developers and there is, um, plans to allow access through the Python API. And so as long as that functionality is implemented, then add-ons will have access to that. And eventually PyClone will just be an add-on. I've kind of um, released this just kind of as a short-term way of you know, allowing users to kind of test it out, give feedback and that sort of information. Sounds good. Um, Thanks. Cool, cool. And I think, I don't know, my camera just might've went to sleep um, really quick. Let me see if I can. Turn it on. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, 
so yeah, any other um, questions about the design functionality? I was going to go ahead and move to the next portion, which kind of just explains more about the um, the assemblies, the PyClone assemblies, and how they kind of constructed and work. Is that good with everybody? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's good. For sure, if, if there's any questions that you know come up along the way, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to um, answer it as we go through. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and start out a new uh, scene here. Well, I guess before I do that, there is a couple more things. And if you've watched some of the videos that I've released on my YouTube channel, you probably, this is maybe review. Um, but here in the home builder, there's the library interface, which will allow you to enter in just kind of default information. Um, so this is like standard cabinet sizes that you might want to use in this scene. So you can kind of do some setup before you start designing just to make it a little bit um, easier to where you don't have to manually change each cabinet one at a time. Also, if you want to adjust the materials, there's the ability to just change out whatever material you want. So here, go into the sample library. And so if I wanted my cabinet exposed surfaces to be this white melamine, I can just click on these different pointers. And so the library is set up in a way that allows you to just kind of quickly select what material you want to assign to these pointers and then update the entire scene. And so again, just trying to implement, you know, simple ways for users to quickly create the designs. Um, moldings is still um, in development, but I'll have that in the next release, just being able to quickly add base and crown molding and things like that to the scene. Being able to switch out different door fronts for the cabinetry um, is available. So just um, selecting, let's see here. Yeah, I'll just select this raised panel. You can again, assign these to the pointer. So rather than using the slab door that I have, you would just assign these and update the cabinet fronts, which here in solid mode, you can kind of see how it's going to, um, you know, just automatically replace those items within the scene. Here, hardware works the same way to where you can select a pole that you want to use. And again, same sort of thing. You just got this pointer system. So your base, tall, and upper, and drawer poles could be different because it is common for different designs to have um, maybe knobs for the drawers, but then standard um, bar poles for the cabinet. So being able to update that information and have that automatically replace all of the assets. Again, just a time-saving feature. So next, this last tab is about being able to create your own assets. So these are all the different types of components that are currently available. And so um, um, if you wanted to I guess, see what assets are currently in this library. You can see the different categories that are available here and then the different assets that show up here. You also have the same kind of thumbnail preview that you can select. But not only can you visualize all the assets, but there's also a way of creating a new type of asset of that style. And then once you kind of build it and create the asset, then you can save that to your library. And so I kind of want to talk about that now, just kind of explain the structure of assemblies and how those work. And so let's go ahead and create a new scene. And first of all, let's go ahead and add in a new assembly. So when you have PyClone installed, it defines the structure of what an assembly is. And so here, if we add this, we can give it a name. We'll just leave it at new assembly for right now. And that creates the structure. And if we take a look at just the Blender information, so if we open up the outliner, we can see that we have this base point empty. And these are all just empty objects. It's a pretty standard uh, thing if you're familiar with Blender, to where we have the base point, which kind of controls the location and rotation of the assembly. And then nested within that, we have the X object which if we type G and move that, you can see it only moves along the X axis. We have the Y axis object, which only moves along the Y. And then of course the Z, which only moves up and down. And so this is the minimum structure of what assembly is um, required. And then um, here, if we, uh, well, we can one X, you know, right click, just like everything else, we can always access the properties from here. And so here we can always change the dimension of this um, information, but you can also access that same interface in the sidebar. And so here, we'll go ahead and take a look at it like this. So obviously the main dimension, location, rotation properties, which we've already seen, 
prompts is a um, new concept that's specific to PyClone. Blender implements the ability to add in custom properties to your objects and just different assets within your scene. But there are pretty limited as far as how the user can interact with them. And so the prompt system just allows you to one, give it a name and then also specify a type. And so being able to specify that this is a distance value and have it formatted in that way um, just really helps the user understand when they're changing the prompts, you know, how it's going to work basically. And so, um, you know, being able to add a checkbox and here I'm just going to add in one that's called hide. So let's say we wanted a prompt that would hide this assembly. We have now just this simple checkbox that can be used to hide. It doesn't currently do anything yet, but um, we'll set that up here in just a minute. But just so we can take a look at a few other options. So like a percentage value is pretty common just to be able to see that this value, you know, goes from, you know, zero to one as a percentage, uh, being able to add in a combo box, basically like a list of different items. And so here we can add in, you know, a few different items within this and just kind of have a visual way of seeing what options are available for that prompt. Um, but here it's going to delete these real quick. And so other than prompts, we can see in the objects tab, this will be the list of all of the objects that are currently in this assembly. And so if we wanted to add one, uh, a mesh object is going to be a really common asset that you would, or a common object type that you would see within one of these. And we'll just go and click OK. That will add in the object that will fill the bounds for this assembly. Um, and just so it's not a cube, let's say that we're creating maybe a carcass of an assembly. Um, I'm just going to model this out in some sort of a way just so it looks a little bit more interesting. OK, so now we have just a standard box, just a carcass. Um, and if we wanted to make this parametric, what we would do is basically define hook modifiers for this mesh. And so you'll notice that if we change the size of this assembly right now, it's not going to change the size of the mesh. And so here, if we expand this and go into the um, data tab, um, well, of course, we have the main options that the dimension size location of the mesh object. But here, if we want to access the data, the actual mesh, we can enter in edit mode. And this allows us the ability to assign the vertices to these different hooks. So obviously, we have the X, the X object, which is this object, the Z, which is this one. And if we want to assign those, what we do is we go into vertex assign mode. And here, we'll just select all of the vertices that we basically want to move along with the X and assign that. We can select all the vertices that we want to move in the Z direction and assign that. And then the Y dimension, just all of these vertices back here. And so you can see as we assign those, it gives us a number, which just tells us how many vertices are currently assigned to that. Um, and after that, we can click Connect Hooks. And now we'll notice that if we change the size of the assembly, this is you know, going to change along with it. And so that's how we get mesh objects to change size. And this structure is very important, especially when working with Blender objects. Because if you try to change the dimension of a mesh object, like here if we go, we can see there's a dimension for this um, mesh. But if you, one, you can't assign drivers or Python information to those values. And also, if you change this, it also adjusts the scale, which Blender has a hard time dealing with. And so by using that approach, you know, we can still change the size, which will update the dimensions of that object, but it doesn't mess with the scale in any way. So it's just kind of a way of, um, you know, allowing meshes to change size in a little bit smarter way than just changing the dimensions. Apart from that, there's also the material information. And so obviously Blender already implements the ability to assign as many materials as you want to a mesh object. But one thing that it doesn't implement is the ability to assign a name to a material slot. And so let's say we have two material slots. One is going to be the cabinet exterior, and the other one is going to be the cabinet interior. 
now we have those two material slots named. And it surprises me that Blender doesn't have this already. It does have a name property, but it always takes on the name of the material that's assigned to it. So it doesn't allow you to use this sort of naming convention and then assign a material to that slot. But apart from the name, we can also enter in a pointer for this, and that's going to be the information that's um, listed here. And so we have the cabinet interior surfaces. And so if we want um, this to be, or I guess we'll do this one, cabinet We'll sign cabinet interior surfaces there, and then we'll sign cabinet. Oops. Exterior surface says to that one. Then in edit mode, we're going to assign these as well. And so all I'm going to do is just select these faces and then assign them to that material slot. And with that done, if we come here and then update the material information, it's going to assign that data. I think I just um, maybe named something wrong here. Cabinet exterior. Let's see here. Oh, exposed surfaces. Sorry. Um, so yeah, obviously you need to make sure that that is named correctly. Um, and this should probably also be a drop down as well, just so you can kind of see um, an easy way of just selecting those. But of course, there's going to be many improvements. Um, coming in the future. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is the logic tab. And so a very big part of how all of these assemblies are parametric is being able to utilize Python to assign a, um, a driver, basically any sort of logical expression. And so right now, this object doesn't have any drivers assigned to it. And within Blender, and this is a standard um, Blender thing to where if you right click on any properties, you can add a driver to it. And so if we select that, Blender gives you this interface, which is a little bit difficult to work with, um, but it allows you to enter in any um, Python expression and have it evaluate to what it needs to be. Um, the only thing I do here is I typically just delete the default variable and I use my interface to define that. And so here in the logic tab, we can see we're seeing the drivers for the selected object. We can also see the drivers for the location, rotation, and dimension information, um, or prompts or calculators, which I don't think I have time to uh, get into that. But for the selected object, what we want to do is we want to change this formula to um, something that actually means something. So var plus false is just kind of nonsense. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just the default information that's assigned. But since I added a driver to the viewport option, this is just an option that basically hides or unhides this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the prompt that I created to that property. And so all I do is I add a variable. And so if I click new assembly, that's going to be where it accesses the variables from. And right now it's obviously itself, just the new assembly that we're working with. And so we have the X dimension, Y location and rotation. And then of course, any prompts that we've added. And so if we want to access that variable, we click add there and that will add our variable. We can see it currently evaluates to false. And here we can just copy that variable, put it in our expression. And now when we check this box, it hides the mesh. Now this is a very, very simple um, one that's used here if we drop in a cabinet and just kind of take a look at some of these. Um, so here we have the right side. So the dimension of that assembly is evaluating to height. So the height of the cabinet, the um, Z is the material thickness for that. Um, and here, let's hide this. So let's maybe take a look at the shelf. So this shelf is the interior width minus the shelf clip gap. And so all of this information is all defined in Python in the actual add-on for a home builder. And so you can basically build all of these, um, you know, Python drivers that will construct this cabinet the same way every single time. And then you can swap out the components like we do for the door to where, um, you know, we define just a standard assembly for a door and it's built in the same, you know, way for every type of door. 
And so it just provides you a quick way of just kind of swapping out whatever assembly you want and all of the formulas and everything apply to that. And so, um, so I know here we typically only like to um, go for an hour. So maybe I'll just look at some of these questions. Um, and I, we think we also want to leave some time for just kind of general discussion at the end. But um, let's see here. Can we use Archipack Pro with Pyclone? Yeah, and that's actually something that I want to implement. Um, I already, in here, I, you can see I have kind of a test for Archipack to where I have all of the standard Archipack information. And so I actually want to use Archipack for all of the room layout that way kind of using both systems, but then maybe use the Pyclone specifically for the cabinetry and things that will need to be manufactured later on. But here we can drag in a wall and we can, you know, just uh, create the information just like we would expect. So we can draw out walls in Archipack and then the same thing, we can just take the door and it works very similar to how the system you know, or how my standard assets work. So I do want to kind of combine a lot of that information. Um, next, let's see, is there 2D indwelling feature in the pipeline? Yeah, so um, yeah, being able to generate 2D and 3D drawings um, is absolutely um, going to be happening. Looking at the Blender BIM add-on, looks like there's a lot of functionality being added there. And so I do want to do some research and maybe talk to Dion about how we can kind of work together to find the best way to implement a system for generating elevation and plan views and sections and all that. Um, where do you want to go with this? What are the next assets? Um, I am developing a roadmap right now. A lot of the functionality that I'm doing is, or a lot of what I'm developing right now is tutorials to explain to people how to create their own assets. Cause obviously I can't, do it all myself. There's so many different types of assets to make. So I want to be able to enable the community to be able to add their own and define their own assets that um, they can use. Can you have a Blender BIM tab in your assembly dialog? Um, yeah, and I still need to do some research on Blender BIM and understand exactly um, how a lot of that information is configured, but that is definitely the goal of, you know, kind of utilizing all the information that's out there and kind of making, you know, uh, the best and easiest to use um, system. Um, you have walls, you can implement beams, slabs, and columns. Yes, absolutely. And so again, like there, there are, there's so much information already added to Archipack. If I could just use the best out of all of those different add-ons, then I think that we'll have a, you know, a really good system. But um, let's see here, is there 3D animation and 3D printing feature in your roadmap? So it's, Blender, you know, already has a really strong 3D animation system and it is a little bit complicated to use. Obviously you have to be an animator, know how the system works, but I do want to implement a simple way of generating like a walkthrough. That's a pretty common your designer just being able to um, generate some sort of an animated thing that you can send to your client um, and 3d printing I mean, blender already exports a lot of the formats for 3d printing so i think that you know maybe at some point i'll look into trying to simplify that whole process but um, i haven't put a much thought into it right now um, did have i miss you, any questions or? <laughs> oh good yeah have you tried to scale uh for a bigger uh, project with many, many kitchen, for example. Um, wait, say it again, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't quite. Ha have you made, perform some tests, scale, scaling tests uh, to see if you can, uh, for example, make 100 of uh, kitchens in the same project? Um, make 100 kitchens in the same project so like in the same file yeah um i no, i haven't done that exact test um i would imagine that each blender file 
would be one room. And I do want to implement a system for managing projects to where a lot of the times there's going to be you're designing a kitchen and a closet or wardrobe space and maybe a bedroom or some furniture in the office. And I think if there was a way to maintain multiple different Blender files in their own room and then have kind of a master Blend file, which is basically the linked information of all of that, then um, I think that might be a good approach. But um, as far as, yeah, scaling and creating massive environments, um, yeah, I haven't quite done any stress testing on that to see how much we can fit. But I think that there's always that possibility of, yeah, linking rooms into a master project that way. You don't have one Blender file. That's just this massive thing. It's got linked assets from other um, files within one project that you're working on. Hopefully that answered the question. Yes. I have a hopefully a quick question. Um, sure. With Blender, it seems that there's a lot of uh, tools coming out that uh, allow you to parameterize objects. You know, you got the Sverjack uh, nodes, the new geometry nodes, um, and then your um, system of Pi clone. Do you see any crossovers or, um, you know, redundancies there? Um, or what, what what do you envision a roadmap looking like, I guess, considering all these different ways of parameterizing objects? Um, I'll need to put a bit more thought into that. That's kind of where I'm at right now, as far as really trying to figure out the best direction. I know that one of the key things is just being able to train other people how my system works, but um, but for sure, the, the next step is really kind of looking at all of the different possibilities and um, talking with the other developers and finding the best direction to move forward. But I don't have a clear way I can explain that right now, but it is something that will be coming. Sure. Does that make sense? No, it's, yeah, it's a hard uh, um, question to answer, you know, because uh, there's a lot of um, initiatives out there um, and a lot of developer time in certain areas. And it makes sense to ride off one versus the other, just so. Yeah, and it's hard, hard to answer, but just want to ask the question. No, for sure. Absolutely. I, I, have, oh, I, I have a couple of questions, but my, uh, first of all, are you familiar with the way families in Revit work? So I've been doing a lot of research recently into that, um, and not only just Revit, but also a lot of uh, Dion's videos on how IFC files are structured and all of that. I'm not um, that familiar with Revit and how families work in there, but um... because this seems very similar to the system in Revit, uh, um, that like okay. Uh, first of all, uh, do you think uh, can you um, nest the fam like the objects into each other? Because uh, I don't quite understand if you have to model each part in each object, or can you reuse the parts in different objects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, if we take a look, let me just create another scene here. Take a look at this cabinet. If we look at the structure of it, there's only one assembly, which is basically a cube that's used for pretty much this entire, um, for this entire thing here. And if we look at the structure, you know, we've got the main product, which is a base door cabinet. And then within it, we have a carcass and a countertop. And then within the carcass, we have a back, bottom doors, left side. And there's even like some assemblies that are used just as a cutout. And so you have just the cutout for the toe kick notch in the cabinet. And so, yeah, you can nest this structure. And again, all of these are defined in Python. So I'm not building these in Blender one by one. I define a class or just a Python class, which is a cabinet. And I define another class, which is a carcass. And then there's other classes within that, which are cabinet parts. And so there is um, what I think a really uh, good way to maintain 
these complex structures. And again, I don't really ever do any modeling for a lot of these. When it comes to like creating like a raised panel door, that one asset is modeled, but, um, but yeah, you can nest these structures and there's a, a way of, or there's a whole Python API as far as working with assemblies. Okay. Uh, second question. Do you in, uh, intend to implement uh, different representations, different levels of details for each object? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it kind of depends on um, what object you're talking about. Like for a cabinet within yeah. the properties, there will be ways of um, like in the cabinet construction, like right now these pretty bare bones, but you know, right now we can see the shelf holes in here. There may be some ways of just saying like, okay, don't show machining and don't show the interior hardware. Then it just kind of will strip down what's available for that cabinet. If you're talking about level of details for um, like subdivision surfaces for like a heavy furniture object, um, I probably will at some point look a little bit more into automating uh, the ability to have, um, yeah, just some sort of a function that will swap out heavier poly assets for lighter poly. But all of the assets that I'm creating right now are generally very, very low poly. Like they're just cubes <laughs> with, you know, in some cases like bevel modifiers assigned to them with a very small amount, just so it does have, you know, a bit more geometry, but. No, I mean, generally, because for us as architects, it's usually the problem with these assets measures that they are too detailed. And we like halfway through projects, we still want to have really basic geometry, just uh, not to get into too much detail. And most of the time, it's the problem that we have to dumb down these things, make them simpler. It's very hard because uh, all of them are very advanced and you, you just have to go through hundreds of uh, settings to make them look really simple. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, no, I think that will definitely become, um, I'll definitely be putting some more thought into that as I get there. Like I said, right now, a lot of the assets that I'm using are already pretty low poly um, assets, but, um, but yeah, defining a way of even just basically saying, okay, there is going to be, this really detailed chair here, but right now I'm just representing it as a cube or as this very, very low poly object. And then have a way of swapping out those assemblies is definitely possible. I mean, it's kind of similar to what I'm doing with swapping out the hardware or the door panels on the cabinet to where the parametric ability is defined within the assembly, which is the, the core structure. So just those five empties that make up the base point XYZ object, things like that. Um, and so being able to swap those out and retain parametric functionality is definitely possible. And that's kind of what I'm already demonstrating when I swap out a door to where, um, oops, hit the magic close button on there. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so when I swap out a door, it's, you know, going through that process automatically and assigning the Python drivers to this new assembly that we have. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And maybe a last question. Uh, you show like this, how you change the materials for the whole kitchen. Uh, the way it works in uh, Revit is that you can save different uh, presets for the objects and they are kept in the placed, uh, placed object, if you know what I mean. Like you place three copies and two of them, select two of them, uh, give them a name and then they keep the same properties and you can change them globally. Is it clear what I mean? Um, I'm a little unsure exactly what you mean. Um, like I, I have the same, same base object, make uh, 10 copies and I want uh, three of those to be 60 centimeters wide, three of those to be 40 centimeters wide, and uh, to always be the same one. And so I can just select one of them, change them, and all the, the ones that are 
60 centimeters to 40 centimeters. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to explain. I think this is something you can do with Blender natively. Yeah, actually, you're right. Theoretically. But like, it would be nice to have a, a name like cabinet, uh, I don't know, cabinet 60 and uh, all of the cabinets 16 in the projects to be able to change their material at once, not to have to click on all these in, in your manager. Right, right. And I guess with the process of switching out materials, um, so I guess I have this pointer system that I developed, which is a really simple concept to where, you know, the objects are assigned pointers or like for the door, it's assigned to a pointer. So every cabinet that I have in the library, when I swap out the door, I'm not swapping out one individually, I'm swapping out the entire project. And with this pointer system, the next iteration of it is being able to assign groups to your assets. So if you had... So right now, basically, this is at a global level to where I can only have one setup for materials for a project, but it's possible like in the commands to say, create new grouping and then have these different variations of material setups, which can then be assigned to your products. And so let's say like maybe the island products are a different material than the products along the wall. It's a pretty common design thing that happens. You could you know, create a grouping that is, you know, island materials and, you know, have those products assigned to that one. So when you change out the materials, it knows what groupings to automatically assign, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, cool, great. Um, are, are there any plans to make uh, this content more platform agnostic to actually share it with other BIM platforms or not necessarily? Um, I guess it depends. I mean, I guess, isn't that kind of the focus of like the IFC structure of being able to, you know, Correct. have these. And well, so... that's one, one method. Yeah. And that's the reason I asked the question. Um, I had actually posted on the, the OS arch forum about, um, it's not very common, but there's work out there in the field of making IFC parametric. Um, and so there, there are means to do it. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any plans in, in utilizing that potentially, uh, in the future, it's, it, you know, it's still bleeding edge for everybody out there, but you know, some people are actually doing prototypes around it and I could see this type of content working well, uh, with what I've seen anyways. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, as it becomes a demand, I guess more, um, concrete as far as how that would work, you know, that's definitely something I'd be interested in looking into. Cool. Hi, Andy. I, I once um, got asked to, to create um, an interface for using augmented reality to present um, like cabinets and um, kitchen equipment and stuff like that um, for people who sell furniture and showrooms and such businesses. I'm wondering if um, you've ever considered um, creating that kind of um, platform together with uh, what Home Builder already does. I see a strong possibility of having that with the Godot game engine, for example, which is also open source and works quite well with Blender. Um, I just thought to mention that to you that there's a great opportunity for getting that done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see that I would have to do a lot of the development there. I mean, I've already tested, and it's not augmented reality, but Blender already has a add-on for VR to where it's native to Blender, and I've got an Oculus Rift here, and so I haven't needed to do any development in order to make Home Builder VR compatible to where you know I just enable the add-on, put on the headset, and it works natively within Blender and everything is great. So I would imagine that there is gonna be more development just from Blender's core developers to support more augmented reality and just other 
types of functionality like that. And I think that's kind of the, the benefit of using Blender just because they have so much rapid development being done um, by the community. You know, there's always new stuff that I can just take advantage of. And since it's, you know, everything that I'm developing is compatible natively with Blender, that just makes it to where I can take advantage of all of that functionality. You know, maybe um, there might be some functionality to simplify how the setup is for certain devices maybe, but yeah, definitely something to take a look at. Then opening, closing doors. Yeah, I don't know if someone, but being able to open the door is here. It's again, just a Python driver. Just a question in the in the chat there. Um, I'm just reading through questions. If there's anything else that people have, I'll um, happily answer anything else. Um, there's a question about curved walls um, on, and then being able to assign a door and a window. Again, I think Archipack probably has a lot better system when, especially when it comes to the layout of the room, there's a lot of um, thought that Stefan put into that to allow it to, you know, specify a type of wall and make it curved. And so I think really the key is going to be um, combining the concepts of these different add-ons and making them compatible to where you can use assets interchangeably between the different types of products. Um, question there, cabinets have some standard sizes, but everything else is manufacturer specific. Uh, do you plan to support particular manufacturers? And so, yeah, right now, like when you add in a range into the scene, this is kind of like a parametric range. It's just really generic. It's just meant to where you can change the size to be whatever you want, just so you have some sort of a representation if there's some specific model that you're using. But of course, Thermidor has a lot of their 3D models that I was able to import and optimize and you know make compatible with the system. So all of these are specific sizes to where um, when you you know switch these out, they are standard. And of course, like there's so many manufacturers and so many assets that would need to be created. I probably won't be doing a lot of the development work. When it comes to creating all of these, I wanted to just build a base structure and hopefully partner with different manufacturers to make it um, to where they can easily maintain their own libraries of yeah. assets. Well, that's another reason to try to make this content as agnostic as possible because you have these manufacturers and they only have so much budget to model this stuff and they want to do it in a way where the content is uh, accessible and as wide an ecosystem as possible, right? And so if it's just blender specific, it, it'd be hard to get a manufacturer on board, especially when the, the blender ecosystem for architects is pretty small at this point, you know? So, but yeah, no, in, ter of, in terms of ho home building though, and um, do it yourself or blenders, you know, probably got a pretty good base already. So there's, there's that. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely see it um, being widely used. Yeah, for people who don't want to pay a bunch of money for a specific software that helps you design kitchens, you know, using this platform and then also with the community of maybe, you know, sharing their own assets and things like that, there will be a lot that, you know, hobbyists and homeowners can do by themselves. But I think Blender is, you know, rapidly becoming more and more popular. And so at some point later on down the line, there may be, um, I guess it might be more of an industry standard tool, but I think there's a little bit ways to go before that happens. Did you consider using nodes instead of the user inf interface for the parameters? Because I feel like the user interface for the uh, cabinets is very uh, tailored. Do you have a parameter for like a place for a parameter for a door opening? But um, there will be thousands of different types of objects modeled with this. And 
Uh, you can't really build a user interface for each one of them. Wouldn't more generic user interface be better? Um, yeah, I think nodes could be interesting. Um, again, all, like 90% of all of the parametric functionality is defined within Python. And so it's just Python code as far as how all of these components snap together. And I've really only developed this interface as far as being able to kind of see what the drivers are and have this logic panel to kind of um, be used as a way of just diagnosing what's going on in the scene. But again, pretty much everything, the entire library is built with a Python script. And for me, that's just what I'm more comfortable with rather than using nodes. Um, just because if I were to set up a node system, you know, within Blender, and Blender has like geometry nodes coming and a lot of really exciting things happening in that space, sure. um, especially when it blend. It's interesting, uh, especially but, when uh, Blender has for me uh, the everything nodes kind of moving in a little bit um, more defined direction. But yeah, definitely worth taking. Yeah, because I think for architects, for example, uh, this. Uh, step from uh, changing parameters to programming, you know, writing scripts in Python is really huge. If you did kind of this middle middle step uh, with nodes, it might be much easier for for architects, for example, to grasp because writing, writing text uh, to design something is for most of them just impossible. For sure. Yeah, no, and I don't foresee architects or designers ever writing code in any way. Um, the idea is to, you know, define the core structure of the library in code just to make it easier to manage and maintain, um, but have a much more visual component to where if a designer does want to create some door style, they're not doing that in code. They just, um, you know, they would go through the process of designing it within the interface. Like, and it, it's, still does take some um, understanding, but if I wanted to create a new cabinet door, I can just come here, create new asset that defines kind of the main structure of the door. And then from here, I could add in what would be the door mesh. Um, and here, obviously you have all of the standard blender tools that you can use to you know, define exactly how this thing needs to be, um, I guess, how it needs to look visually. And so there is kind of that aspect to where they aren't writing code if they are defining their own custom object. They would just, you know, model out their um, door using standard, you know, Blender functionality. And then once they're done, they can save that to the library to um, provide them a quick way of just creating a new style that can be added. So that's kind of the, the majority of users would take that approach, but, um, but for developers, they can kind of define the structure in Python to um, make it a little bit easier to determine how all these components need to snap together. And a designer or architect wouldn't really have to uh, think about it or know that that's kind of happening in the background. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, so any other questions or was there any um, anything else on the agenda for just the community? Yes, let's see if, if uh, let's see if there are any, any more questions for this and uh, if there is not, uh, we're going to stop the recording and then we will have uh, another recording for uh, the, the discussion after. So if there is no more questions, we can move to the second part. Okay, I see no objections. So I'm just going to stop recording. <laughs>